Pastor Mike Winger is an apologist. He is a featured teacher of Bible Thinker Online Ministry, online at BibleThinker.org. And we're going to discuss the importance of Christian apologetics with Pastor Mike Winger, who joins me now. Pastor, thanks for being with us today. Hey, Bob, thanks for having me. Glad to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, This time of year, I mean, I would say all the time we need to put 1 Peter 3.15 into practice, of course, but uh, this time of year especially, because people are going to be getting together with a lot of family member and friends, and there's going to be skeptical non-believers and that cranky Uncle Joe who says, oh yeah, well, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? Uh, and so talk about how important it is that as believers, it's not like we have to know everything about everything, but we need to at least equip ourselves to be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have when someone asks us, but to do this with gentleness and respect. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's so valuable. And a lot of times for Christians, you know, you've had such an experience with God, the Holy Spirit working in your life that you feel you don't need these this evidence and the answers to all these questions. But when we think about evangelism, we think about, say, our, our, uh, our cranky uncle, perhaps, or maybe just someone who's even a reluctant skeptic, you know, they just, they don't have this experience with God. They have questions, they have intellectual barriers and it's just love to have good answers to the things that they're asking and to not just tell them I had an experience, but but say, hey, here's why this, this thing you think is a problem isn't a problem. This shouldn't be a barrier between you praying, you reading the word, you seeking God, you coming to Christ. I, I think it's Im- immensely valuable. And as we look at, like, say, the book of Acts, we actually see the disciples do it all the time, even those who were eyewitnesses of his resurrection, went out and made a case that Jesus was the Messiah of the Old Testament, you know, a fulfilled prophecy case, or Mm -hmm. gave examples of why people should believe in the resurrection of Christ. Um, It says that Paul would reason and basically debate with with skeptics as he talked to them in the synagogues and in the open marketplaces. So we're we're just following, you know, in their footsteps. Absolutely. Well, and what you folks do at Bible Thinker, I mean, there's really... Uh, three main areas of teaching that you focus on. Uh, One of them, of course, is teaching accurate theology, confronting the false teachings theologically, doctrinally. Another one, of course, is uh, answering the skeptics, uh, we know. And then another one is applying God's Word to your life. And so uh, let's start, first of all, with the answering of the skeptics, since we are going into Christmas, and there's, there are going to be those family members that, oh, yeah, what about this? What about that? I'm in the middle of a series with my listeners. Uh, the evidence is that the Bible is true. I want them to know it's true historically, archaeologically, but that also that it is, in fact, inspired by God. It's not just some religious writings and good literature, it actually really is God's Word revealed through human writers. And so what would you say, Pastor, if you're sitting next to somebody on a plane and they're like, eh, you know, how can I really believe the Bible is true? Is there a particular area, that there's so much to unpack there, but is there a particular area that you'll tend to point to first or start with? Yeah, I, I think that, I like I said, I, I like to follow in the footsteps of the apostles, and they would go to fulfilled prophecy. So, well, let me let me just say this. If the person doesn't believe in God, then I start with reasons to believe in God. Right. Um, if they think, no, I'm open to there being a God, a higher power, then, then I go right to fulfilled prophecy. So okay. you might ask them to look at, say, Psalm 22, which um, is believed even in, in, in uh, by ancient rabbinical Jews to be a messianic prophecy, effectively, about the Messiah. And this is something Jesus quotes on the cross. And he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? This verse that causes people to scratch their heads. What does he mean there? And they don't realize he's being a rabbi, bringing a whole chapter of scripture to people's minds. And when they think about Psalm 22 and they see Jesus on the cross, what they see is he's fulfilling Psalm 22. I mean, here's a a, a chapter that was written a thousand years before Jesus, hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented. Jesus quotes it on the cross and it talks about how a powerful group of people will conspire against this person in the psalm, that he, in other words, he won't just be assassinated quietly, but it will be an open conspiracy to kill him, that he will be seen as wicked, but he's actually innocent. Then it describes things that fit specifically crucifixion. He's dehydrated, his bones are out of joint, his his hands and feet are pierced, and it even talks about him going to the dust of death. But then the psalm, not only does it fit his death, it fits his resurrection and, and actually the last 2,000 years because it talks about Christ coming, uh, or the person in the psalm, which we see as the Messiah, coming with victory over this death. 
And then this is what blows my mind, and people miss this all the time. It says that the Gentile nations of the world, because of this event in Psalm 22, they're going to turn and worship the God of Israel. Now, that's a bold prophecy because it's literally about converting people across the planet to the worship of this God that that is only really acknowledged in one small nation in, in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, in fact been completely fulfilled in Christ. It's it's an amazing prophecy. I love walking people through it. And they know enough usually about Jesus that they see the dots getting connected right before their eyes. Right. No, that's such a great point. And actually, when you mention Psalm 22, there's something else about Psalm 22 that I just want to throw in as, as a side note, because a lot of people may not know this. In all of human history, in 6,000 years of human history, and 35 to 400 years of all recorded human history available today, there's only been one method of execution ever discovered that pierces hands and feet, and that's crucifixion. There is no other method ever discovered in all of human history that pierces hands and feet other than crucifixion. Uh, crucifixion, of course, we know Jesus was crucified, his hands and feet were pierced. Crucifixion was invented about three to four hundred BC. Okay. However, Psalm twenty-two sixteen was written about a thousand BC, and this prophesies about how the coming Messiah is going to be killed, and it says his hands and his feet will be pierced. That had to make no sense to people three thousand years ago when they were reading this in Psalm twenty-two sixteen. Crucifixion wasn't going to be invented for another six or seven hundred years left. I, I, they're just, I, I guess what I'm thinking, Mike, is there, there are just so many examples like what you just brought up, what I just brought up. There are so many examples of things like this that are not logically possible in the natural if the Bible is not Holy Spirit supernaturally inspired and just a bunch of literature written by regular men. There's no explanation for any of this in, in the natural. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. And so there are two pushbacks, say, on this piercing thing that we're talking about right, right. now. And one of them is, a, and I'll, I'll have responses to these, but one's a skeptical, uh, and this comes from uh, Jewish, what they call, they're called anti-missionaries. Jewish mm -hmm. anti-missionaries who who say, oh, it's not even talking about pierced. It, it's it's mistranslated. It should say just as a lion, my hands and feet. And then it, it ends up being almost a nonsense sentence. And the Masoretic, that is the Hebrew that we have access to that's after the New Testament, but we we just have these old copies. It does say it. It's written in a very strange way. Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls uncovered for us in the, 19th, the 20th century, new copies that were the oldest copies of Psalm 22 we've ever found. And sure enough, and before they're before Christ, so Christians could not have meddled with these things. Right. Sure enough, the Hebrew says, pierced my hands and feet here in the oldest copies from before the time of Jesus. So the, that's one objection. The other objection is that some skeptics have said, um, well, Romans didn't really pierce. They would tie people's hands. They didn't pierce them with nails, and they wouldn't allow them proper burial, which Jesus supposedly had in the New Testament. But not only has this been proven wrong in the last like 40 years, because we found pierced bones of crucified, crucified victims who were properly buried, one right. guy in particular in Jerusalem around the time of Jesus. But we just found a new one like within a week ago. They found a new one in Northern Europe, a, a crucifixion victim whose uh, feet had been pierced by nails, demonstrating that this is, again, supported by the evidence. Right. And actually, there are a lot of examples of the kind of thing that you're talking about where uh, the skeptics will claim, oh, this is not true in the Bible. And then what do you know? There's some new discovery, some new archaeological discovery, something that's like, oh, well, hey, what do you know? It turns out that the timeline of the Bible was really right. Turns out that what was written about in Scripture was really right. Turns out that that king really did exist. Turns out that that, you know, that language really was around at that time. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how the skeptics will claim, oh, this is disproven. And then before you know it, somebody uncovers something in the ground and the skeptics go rut row and then they try to move on to a different uh, a different gnat to swat at. So, uh, yeah. no, it's a very good point. I'm glad that you brought that up. I'll tell you what, Pastor, hang on just a moment. Short break, and we'll pick it up from there, there on next. More with Pastor Mike Winger. Uh, folks, his website, BibleThinker.org. It's BibleThinker.org. And we'll talk some more Christian apologetics next here on The Bob Duco Show. You're listening to The Bob Duco Show. Spending our last few minutes with Christian apologist Pastor Mike Winger. 
uh, talking about uh, his uh, online ministry, of course, Bible Thinker at BibleThinker.org and the need and the importance of Christian apologetics. Uh, let's talk a little bit, Pastor, about confronting false teachings, false doctrine, making sure our theology is accurate. Well, I'll tell you what, there are so many issues right now, uh, false teachings and doctrines that are being spread through the body of Christ. It's like a cancer. I've been talking with my audience over the last few weeks about this probe ministry study that came out not too long ago, asking self-described born-again Christians, do you believe that other religions, world religions, they can also lead to heaven? And it's just under 70% that said yes. It's like, my goodness, you know, it's amazing how many people are professing to be Christians, going to church mm -hmm. every week, and they believe that, well, the important thing is you have some kind of spirituality, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, as long as they're sincere in what they believe and they're good, nice, decent people, uh, heaven becomes a default reward for them. And something as basic as the exclusivity of salvation through Jesus Christ and his shed blood is being shifted, Pastor, from one of the non-disputables over into a disputable. And I'm like, no, that cannot happen. But uh, it does seem a lot of these false teachings are creeping their way more and more into the church these days. Yeah, I do um, find it all deeply concerning. <laughs> to me, it kind of splinters into a bunch of different kinds of issues. So one is, say, the people who their theology is developed based on a, um, a, a rule of niceness. Mm -hmm. And so when they're asked questions about theology, they don't ask, what does scripture teach? They ask, what seems to be the kind, nice answer to that question? And so then this can lead us down some dangerous paths because what appears to be nice isn't always nice if it's wrong. It's misleading and potentially dangerous for people. And then you've got the world getting smaller through social media and online interactions. So people are being exposed to false teachings they'd never heard before. And many are falling prey to it. But others are coming out of false teachings for the same reason, so that's good. But yeah, there's just such a deep need for us to just simply read the Bible and be able to understand a verse in context. I think it's one of the greatest, most important things a Christian can do is just to be able to say, I read that and it made sense, <laughs> so now it can't right. be used against me. <laughs> well, where where do you see some of these false teachings and, and uh, the inaccurate theology and such. I mean, I mentioned one example here, salvation exclusively through Jesus Christ. Are there some other areas, some other red flag issues that you're seeing a growing number of Christians falling for? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's this thing that that has become a self-titled uh, progressive Christian Christianity. And right, right. there's a large group of people that are progressive Christians who are very, and here's the thing, groups grow when people are aggressively promote them. And, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether what they're promoting is good or bad. But progressive Christianity is being promoted very strongly. And it's strongly uh, affirming of, uh, you know, our current sort of trending morality that we see online. Mm -hmm. It's And it's very, very much centered on the absolute rejection and even demonization of evangelical Christianity. Evangelical Christianity is seen as 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 the woe upon our society that we have to overcome. And so they feel as though they're, I think they feel like they're social justice warriors that are overcoming oppressive um, evangelicals, you know. Right. But, but the problem is I'm all for questioning our traditions. And so many Christians are. We're, we're like, hey, I want to filter everything through the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. But we have to do that with the with the Word of God as our guide and not culture as our guide. And that's that's the danger of progressive Christianity. It appeals to pop culture and then seeks to um, leverage the sort of sense of injustice that they see in oppressive religious stuff, right? That, that's the, the language that is used. Ultimately, though, there's no commitment to the genuineness of Christ. So you get reinterpretations of Jesus. You know, one progressive Christian pastor he you know, had a viral video where he was talking about how Jesus was racist, but he overcame his racism, mm. right? And, and this is like a, a you, you pretty much see where you're at because you either respond repulsed by this because you know Jesus, Jesus is holy, or you think it's good because it fits so well with our culture. And there's a divide there that we, we need to be aware of, yeah. It, it seems as though, and I not to try to make this a political thing, but it does seem like the the political 
liberalism, progressivism, uh, seems to be joined at the hip in many ways with uh, biblical or uh, theological or progressive uh, liberalism as well. And, and 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 looking at this scripturally, you know, I look, I can handle if somebody is politically progressive, I'm going to say, all right, you know what, I disagree with you. But if they're a believer in Christ, it's not a salvation issue. Uh, yeah. But but I'm so I'm more concerned about somebody being biblically progressive or liberal than I am them being politically liberal. or. Pro- uh, but the truth is, uh, if you look at people that are embracing liberal left-wing political views in this country, and they're professing Christians, it seems like they drag their their interpretation of Scripture in a wayward way to the left as well. I, I don't know about you, but I hardly ever, I pretty much never run into anybody who is sliding more to the left politically and more traditional and to the right biblically. I just, I, I, I never see that. It seems like they both slide to the left. And so we got to recognize that first and foremost, we got to stand on the authority of God's word and that that flies into the face of what you believe politically or emotionally uh, too bad. But that, that right now, everything seems to center around what feels right to me, what makes me feel good, what affirms me, what do I think is fair? And it just seems very narcissistic in my honest opinion. Right. I, I think there's, it's, I mean, it's a longer discussion, but it, it does feel like it's coming from a place of thinking that um, my desires will establish my actual identity. And that's, yeah. this isn't just about uh, sexual desires. It, it's, it's all across the board that, that sort of it's the, I'm the reality maker. My opinions right. are the reality maker. And, and once you have that in place, you simply cannot hold to a biblical view for long. So I, I agree with you. Um, the most politically um, stringent and active and committed people I know, as far as that are that are openly, they call themselves Christians, are are the the progressives and the commitments to the liberal side. Most of the conservative Christians I know are deeply concerned about the potential of pride and arrogance and and compromise as as um, being associated with you know say Republican Party or something like that. But the liberal ones, there's just zero i'm just being honest here there just seems to be very little self-awareness yeah. that there's a difference between your political commitments and your christian ones and that one is supposed to lead the other <laughs> you know there right. just doesn't seem to be there i know well it's, and it's I, real sad I, frankly i see an idolatry of self that is a uh, kind of a foundation for a lot of this personally but uh i'll tell you what folks uh, apologetics is a good and necessary thing i encourage you to go to the website biblethinker.org biblethinker.org uh, their featured teacher at bible thinker is pastor mike winger and pastor interesting discussion i appreciate you being with us today thank you so much thank you too have a great one thank you pastor you too you're listening to the bob duco show <laughs> 